I'm Mike Haddock and we're in, in Washington, D.C. And that's the Washington Cathedral behind us. And I'm with Chuck Harding and his wife, Joe. They invited me down. We took a tour of the cathedral. You met the guy who wrote the book. The cathedral was started in early 1900s and finished in 1990. And we met the stonemason and we're gonna talk about mortar. And what's your take on it? Well, you know, no matter what faith you follow, the National Cathedral is a piece of artwork. It's a masterpiece in architecture. If you're looking at the stonework or the wood carving or the stained glass, you can come and appreciate it from that standpoint. And of course, Joe and I have come several times and it is something that you might say is a modern masterpiece of architecture. That's true. Gothic Cathedral. Yes, Gothic the last cathedral. great Gothic cathedral yeah. built in the world. So the tour guide was really good, oh, yeah. who wrote this book. And the mason was real good, gave us some info on the cement, so we're just going to let it roll. Hi, I'm Andy Bittner. I'm the author of the book, Building Washington National Cathedral. Our building, Washington National Cathedral, or the Cathedral Church of St. Peter and St. Paul, is the largest completed entirely masonry building on this continent. It was built between 1907 and 1990. It is 150,000 tons of Indiana limestone wrapped around a brick core and set in running bond where every single stone in the building was drawn on the blueprint, had a number, a set of instructions, and was custom made to be that one stone in the building. Now, I was just gonna say, Cornerstone, Bethlehem Chapel, that chapel we were seeing inside is dedicated to that first Bishop of Washington, Henry VIII Satterley. So when they set this stone in the spring of 1910, it was actually his grandson, Henry VIII Satterley III, wielding the trowels. Most Gothic flying buttresses are incorporated into the east end of the building. Well, I should say most of them on the east end of the building are incorporated into the building at the bottom, usually because there's a walkway around the high altar at the upper level. These people wanted light to stained glass windows on the lower level, so they eliminated all of that from the upper level, resulting in flying buttresses that can actually be circumnavigated at the bottom. And contrasting with the buttresses you saw around the east end of the building. If you look right here on the north side of the nave, you can see how the base of the buttresses is traditionally incorporated into the building. Our roof, actually depending on which section when it was built, most of them are um, steel or iron girders. Over the north transept on the opposite side of the building, it's all preformed concrete roof trusses. Top of the pinnacle, yeah. You see a lantern, okay. a voided section where it's just standing on columns in the corner. Weak section on the pinnacle. Yeah. And, and this pinnacle shifted very heavily on the lantern. Wow. Almost knocking the top of the pinnacle off. Yeah. Um, and it was so precarious that a few summers ago they said, you know, that thing's coming down one way or the other. Let's do it controlled. Yeah. Yeah. So they've now brought all that down here. Um, sure. Look at that. Sure. And the number 16 in this case will be four major and 12 minor prophets. And at the time that these were carved, they had on staff eight carvers who they felt were qualified sculptors and, and able to do their own imagery. So we're looking at these outside stones. You can see how they got these Lewis pins to pick them up. That's the back of the stones. There's the pinnacle. The carver intertwined them. We're looking at uh, the lead pieces that are on top of this. They put the lead in and then they put the 
Actually, the they set in. the bed on first. They right. put the bed and mortar on first, and then they take the little lead, what they call buttons. It's a little trifold of kind of a lead, thick lead strip, and they push it in at their points into the bed, and then they set the next stone on it, and of course, obviously, that prevents first all the mortar from squirting out, and then it gives you a malleability to that that you level the stone by banging on the top of it with a leather mallet. Put your level on it, dink, 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 bring down that edge. And it's one of the very cool things around a building like this. Indiana limestone struck by a leather mallet is musical. Everything on the building that has organic shape or form is hand carved stone. And one of my favorite examples of that is what arch architects call patera. If you look right above this arch, you see a little row of square flowers that look like dental molding. And when you look at that row of square flowers, what stands out when you look closely is that every one of them is different. That means each one of them is a unique, individually hand-carved work of art that took some stone carver, and I'm talking about a person with a metal chisel, a wooden mallet, and a rock, at least two days to make one flower. They look like dental molding, most people don't even see them. I call them a series of art. And in my gut guess, in that series, there are somewhere between 10 and 12,000 units. If you look halfway up the front, you'll see another row underneath the observation gallery. Go up to it. And all the way at the top, beneath what looks like a railing, is another row of them. The other thing I really like here is the architectural trick at work that makes someone standing where the cameraman is standing right now see all of those square flowers as the same size, which they are not, could not possibly be. The tower's 23 stories high. If you come back down to me, I'll show you. The ones right above the arch are about that big. The ones beneath the railing at the top of the tower are about that big. And when they're this big, they take way more than two days to make. So the whole building, things people don't even notice. Okay, so you want to know about our cement and mortar and all that? Yep. Yeah, well this cathedral, you know, even though it's, you know, we call ourselves a 14th century Gothic cathedral, this cathedral was built in the 20th century and from day one, from 1907, when the first stone was laid, as you know, I mean, Portland cement was around. So this cathedral uh, was built using, you know, modern Portland cement as we know it. And, and it, it is interesting, though, to see the building over the years, different parts of the building as the building evolved. The early, early parts of the building, they used a very, very rich, cement-rich, uh, mortar mix, super hard. I found a speck from 1915 when they were building the east end of the cathedral and the mortar mix in 1915 was two parts sand, one part white Portland cement, and one part lime. So that is one super hard mortar mix. Um, and over the years, you can see, as you know, too hard of a mortar, will create problems and and they've had problems over the years somewhere around the 1950s 60s they softened up the mix to more of a like a type n masonry cement but it's still hard still a very hard mix yep. and um, with our restoration work now with all the earthquake repair and restoration work that we use um, you know we're using a lot of the the bag mixes the restoration mortars um, that that you know, I think are better now. I mean, the, the thinking, as you know, has gone full circle from super hard. I used to work with the old stone masons and masons. Oh yeah, put some more cement in there, make it harder. Harder is better. So we have, I like to think this cathedral is almost like a museum of mortar, uh, you know, throughout the 20th century. Uh, but it is, yeah, a modern Portland cement based mortar mix in this building. And what would the mix be that you use now? Oh, the normal mix now is, you know, like a like a six one and one, 
uh, five one and one and stuff like that, you know. But but it's definitely a lot softer than it was back in the day. Right. And we use also, like I say, the bag mixes, the Edison mixes, and the Yon. Uh, mortar mixes too, the restoration mortars and things like that. And we'll mix up our own, but we definitely mix them up softer than the old timers did. Solomon's Quarry. The high altar is 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and they are brought from the quarry in Jerusalem called Solomon's Quarry, the legendary quarrying spot for the temple, although it was a long time ago. In the floor in front of the altar, there are 10 stones that were brought from the Chapel of Moses on Mount Sinai. So the Jerusalem altar stands founded on the Ten Commandments. We believe in one God is all the way at the other end of the room. So the Nicene Creed runs in visual imagery all the way up the center rib. And the most exciting reality there is that while the creed runs from west to east, the building was built from east to west, and the very first of them set was World Without End, Amen. And it is one of the most profoundly moving statements of commitment and faith. The thing about this, the thing I love about this one, Norman Rome, yes, look at every column capital is different. These are the largest diameter columns ever built. Okay. And they are the four legs to the bell tower. Oh, I get it. Okay. And they're 27 feet thick solid masonry at this level. The British were in the middle of a restoration of the Bell Harry Tower at Canterbury. So when they heard about this Roxas Relics thing, they harvested stones from the Bell Harry Tower at Canterbury. At the time, the greatest stone carving in the world was, was the English revival carving that was happening over there in England. So we just took our gift stones and put them right into an English carving shed where it would have taken a team of carvers, about four or five men, about four or five years to turn it into what you are seeing here. But it is actually a piece for the Episcopalians. It's a piece of the Mother Church. It's a piece of Canterbury Cathedral. Is, is about the suffering and redemption of the Jews in exile. Wow. This window is part of a series in this aisle that men, honor men and women in a variety of fields and professions, and without detailing each one from right to left, they were healing arts, poets and writers, architects and sculptors. The one we're looking at is scientists and technicians. In the center of that red circle is a white ring and in the center of that white ring is a dark spot. That dark spot is arguably the great secular relic of 20th century mankind, a piece of the moon that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin brought back from the Sea of Tranquility in July of 1969. When I was five years old, and wasn't supposed to be in this part of the construction site anyway, the room only came up to here but I can tell you, children get this building, and when you're a little boy, this is a castle. And this carved handrail, a stone handrail carved into a stone wall to a five-year-old, is complete, total castle feature. This is one of my favorites. Happy and way. The man who carved that was being interrupted by chariots. Mm-hmm. Right. And right. here's his work in Washington, D.C. It was given to us by a church in Rome because if St. Paul had turned his head in that direction, St. Paul looked at that stone. I'm going to talk about that tour a little bit. It was really a pleasure to go down there and meet the guy who wrote the book, Andrew Bittner. It's a great book, and if you're a into architecture, you should have this in your library, and if you're a stonemason, you should have this in your library. Also, I want to talk, uh, thank Joe Alonzo, the stonemason down there. A lot of good information. I took some of the scenes out of this video that I put on there. But the big, the big deal was I had to shorten the video to make everything fit. As far as being a stonemason, 
the big things to notice there is the Lewis pins. They drill the holes, they put the pins in and they pick it up. That's the way the old timers did it. Also those lead pieces, when I was in the Union we would use spacers, but these lead pieces you could bounce it and make that stone sit the way you want to. What Joe talked about the cement is priceless. There's so much uh, controversy on the internet and what uh, cement to use and what mix to use. I always preach that every mason has their own recipe for a certain type of job at a certain type of place. You just It's not black and white. There's a lot of color to it. I also want to thank Dr. Chuck Harding and his wife Joe who invited me down there and, and took me to that cathedral. They know the whole layout of the land. They lived there all their life. So the big deal about this is it's a real Gothic cathedral and you have real people who was there when it was being built, watched it being built, and, and it was actually building it. So that's a big deal to me, being a stonemason. When they, they, those kind of people talk, I want to make sure I listen. So thanks for watching. I'm Mike Haddock. Until next video.